I'd like you to turn with me please back to Acts chapter 19. <coughs> now we looked at the first part of the chapter the last time I spoke here and now we're going to be looking at the second part. So the first part of the chapter was from verse 1 to 10 and that was the work amongst the Jews and the Gentiles at Ephesus. Now from 11 to 20 we have an interesting incident that occurs at the church at Ephesus in which the sons of Sceva decide that they're going to experiment in doing an exorcism and it all goes wrong. I've got a little book at home which I'm sort of writing. It's called When Church Goes Wrong and this would be a classic example of what would be in that book. Sometimes you see in sometimes in church life things don't go right do they? I'm sure you must have experienced things like that yourself. Well, here we have the sons of Sceva. Then in the last part, which is 21 to 41, we have a riot, a big riot, a murderous riot, which also occurs at Ephesus. But in it all, we see the hand of God at work. You see, these things that seem to go wrong are the things that God uses for blessing. You think, well, how could that possibly be? Well, let's look at it together. Now, at the beginning of the passage, we see it says, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now, what that means is that little expression, the word of God, when you see that in the Bible, it's not referring to the Bible. We sometimes talk about the Bible as being the word of God. But that little word, word, is a special Greek word. It doesn't mean something written down. It means something spoken. So it was the preaching of the gospel that prevailed. And the preaching of the gospel, it just spread and spread and spread. And the effect was that it overcame all opposition. What a wonderful thing when that happens. What a wonderful thing. But when, when the word of God prevails, then the devil doesn't like it. And so that's why we have this interesting incident. But before we look at that, take a look at verse 11 and 12. I'll read it for you in the authorised version. It says this. It says, And God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them now that's weird isn't it do you find that weird i do i mean imagine that because the handkerchief had touched the body remember that the physical body of paul and when he was taken to the sick room where they were laid upon the bed as soon as that handkerchief touched the body they got well again now that's what i call a weird miracle very strange very odd there were other things as well it talks about aprons aprons is just like a towel that you tie around the middle and they would give that to paul and he would touch it don't forget paul was an apostle even his body had special powers for healing and whenever he when he touched the apron and the apron then was packed off and taken away and it was put upon a, a, a sick person they got well again now I heard recently of somebody copying this and for a, so many dollars you could buy a handkerchief that had been prayed over do you know what it made me smile we need to just be very careful as Christians that we don't get really gullible. You know, there are charlatans out there that will take your money, that will pray over a handkerchief and send it to you, and for $50 they'll pray on it, and uh, when that handkerchief touches you, it's supposed to heal you. By the way, I'm not mocking. These are genuinely serious and honest and probably godly people. This isn't mockery, but we just need to be wise. And we need to be sensible. I think it says by Paul, special miracles. I think that this was a very special thing in the life of the Apostle Paul. I don't think probably that it occurs today. I could be wrong. I don't think that it occurs today. 
Also, it says, not only the disease is departed from them, but when these handkerchiefs or aprons touch people, the evil spirits went out as well. We just make of that what we like. We can't change the Bible. The Bible is what it is. We can't change what the Bible says. But we need to be a bit wise about what's happening. Now take a look at verse 13. Now in verse 13 we see that there were certain vagabond Jews. Now the word vagabond is an old-fashioned English word. That's why it's in the, um, the authorised version. It doesn't mean... Right, tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean a thoroughly bad lot. It just means somebody that is a traveller. They travelled, they're Jews that travelled from place to place. And as they travelled from place to place, they made their living out of doing a little bit of good here, a little bit of preaching there. Okay, they were travellers. They were itinerant. And they travelled about going to the little bit, a little bit like, if I might say this, it isn't meant derogatory because I have a lot of respect for them, a little bit like the gypsies of today. They travel, don't they? They have a whole country. These are people that come, they have a heritage from Egypt. That's why they're called gypsies, because of the Egypt character. And they travel. It's their tradition that they travel. And the Jews also had a tradition, some of them had a tradition of travelling. They never had a permanent home. And so they would travel around and on this particular occasion they came to Ephesus and they decided did have a little go at exorcism now they might have done it before and they took people that had evil spirits and they 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 called out over them and they said in the name of the Lord Jesus we adjure you by Jesus who Paul preaches now there were seven sons of Sceva who was a Jew and uh, one of the chief priests. Now, we must remember that exorcism of evil spirits was a ministry of the priests. So you can understand, this was a family thing. And uh, they prayed over them in this way. They said, uh, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. And uh, to their amazement, the evil spirits answered. Whoa, now that makes you yeah, stand up on the back of your neck, doesn't it? You think, whoa, hang on a minute. What? The evil spirits answered, you see. And they said this. They said, um, Jesus I know. And Paul I know. But who are you? I tell you what. If an evil spirit spoke to me like that, I tell you what, I would run a mile. And that's exactly what happened. Because the man in whom the evil spirit was, he jumped on them. And he overcame all seven of them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now let me tell you something. Don't try this. Okay? And don't dabble in occult. This is not a funny thing. This is deadly serious. This evil spirit could have killed them at this rate if we're not careful. And there's one thing in life I've learned. There's one thing I've learnt in life, is to keep away from the occult. To keep well away from mediums. Keep well away from those who communicate with devils. Don't even think about it. Block your ears. Turn around and run away as fast as your legs can carry you. This is not good stuff. Now there's a special study that we can make about demons. Demons are not angels. They're special creatures from Satan. Exceedingly powerful. They have to inhabit human bodies or the bodies of animals. It's a whole subject all in its own right. And it's something that is exceptionally dangerous. And so it's something that I really must warn you as a pastor to keep well away. When something comes on a television program about demons, I turn it off immediately. Let's talk about something else. I just won't even allow myself to be entertained by anything of that nature whatsoever. And as soon as I hear anything of that nature, I immediately shut my ears and I begin to pray and say, Lord, I don't want this stuff. I don't want to hear it. Do you know what? When evil spirits speak, and they, we see the record of speaking, I don't even want to know what they say. I don't even want to enter into discussion. 
about the whole subject. And there have been a couple of times in my life when I've had to deal in terms of evil spirits and it's not a pleasant thing at all. It's something to be studiously avoided. But what was the result? Verse 17. Luke says this. He says, This was known of all the Jews and the Greeks who dwelt at Ephesus. I'm not surprised. I bet this was on the top of the newspaper. Everybody was talking about this. How stupid these men were to think that they should dabble in the occult. To think that they should face a man with an evil spirit. Dear me, how foolish is that? And it says this, it says, and fear fell on them all. Imagine that. Now I want you to imagine something. Imagine a whole city of maybe 20,000 people and the fear of God settles on the place. And it's because of this incident. The fear of God. I was listening to a dear brother, uh, Peter Brandon, quite a, a while ago, and he was talking. He was taking a mission one day, and he, every dinner time, he was an evangelist, a godly, godly man. He's with the Lord now. And uh, he went to the, every day at midday, he would go to, he walked down to the local shop to buy an apple. That was his lunch. It was his habit to buy an apple and to walk for it. And he went into the shop, and uh, he ordered his apple, and he took the apple and paid for it. And the lady said, who are you? And he said, oh, I'm the preacher. I'm preaching up in the little chapel. Oh, she said, you're not one of them Christians, are you? And he said, why? Oh, she said, it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. She said, do you know what? She said, a few years ago, we had some people come to this village. And they were up in the Anglican church. And they held meetings every night. And they prayed all night. And he said, yes. She said it was awful. He said, what was awful about it? She said, you could feel God everywhere. Now that's what you call God at work, isn't it? And that's what happened at Ephesus. And through this strange occurrence, the whole city felt God everywhere. And I tell you what, it was not a comfortable feeling. When your heart is not right with God and you feel the presence of God, it's not pleasant. In fact, it's something that shakes you to the very core of your being. I know, because on the day when I became a Christian, I heard preaching. And uh, I felt as if there was nobody else in the tent but me. And God spoke to me and it frightened me to death. I wept tears and I was, I was unconsolable. Why? Because I felt God there. God spoke to me. And then verse 18. It says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. What happened in Ephesus at this particular time is nothing short than of revival. It's what we call revival. It was a transformation of the whole city. Let's read what happens. It says, Many of them came and confessed and showed their deeds, and many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before them all. And they counted the price of them, and they found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. And so mightily grew the work of God and prevailed. Now let's just look at some of those phrases. First one is, they confessed and showed their deeds. What that means is, they owned up to their secret occult practices. See, these things were done in secret. They were done in the quiet of their own homes and in sealed rooms in the dark. But they all came. When God spoke to the community, they were shaken to the core and they all came and they spilled it all out. And they said, well, I've got something to confess. I've been doing the occult in secret. Okay. Notice also he calls it curious arts. Now, curious means something to be, to be inquired into. And it was the work of mediums. Um, to inquire into things that are not one's own things. That's the whole idea. And these men were inquiring into forbidden things. Let me just say something to you. 
There are certain things that you are not to inquire about. Got that? There are certain things not to fill your mind with. There are certain things that you're not to know about. The Bible talks about the doctrines of demons. Let me tell you, don't even ask. Because whatever it is, it's not good. Keep away. Keep away from it. Don't even think about it. And uh, twice in my life, I've had a responsibility in this church, and I had a responsibility once before in the Brethren, that I discovered that there were young men who were into the occult, and they'd come to know the Lord. Okay? But they had all the stuff. We did it in this church in the early days. Do you know when we, when we had to burn the stuff in this church that belonged to someone that came to know the Lord, it took us three days to get rid of it all. It was worth a fortune. These things are not cheap, you know. There was tarot cards and there was divination and there was everything that you could ever possibly imagine. And they cost a fortune. They were not cheap. In fact, he told me, he said, you see that book? He said, I, I really hesitate. He said, I know it's got to go in the flames, but it cost me 50 pounds. And I said, I know. I said, how much have you burnt so far? And he said, it's thousands upon thousands of pounds worth. Okay? This is how these evil people make their money. And on this particular occasion... Luke records how much money, how much was. There was 50,000 pieces of silver. Now that's about, in 2009, that was about 60, sorry, 6,000 pounds worth of books. Now let me just say something about the ancient world. The ancient world were very poor. 6,000 pounds worth of books is a lot of money. You can see the effect that this had in their lives and then it says the word of God increased and prevailed it says it grew mightily God was working and it was like a steamroller going through the community it was changing lives it was challenging people about what they did in secret and their lives were being transformed and the stuff was being burned and the whole of Ephesus was being wiped clean by the Holy Spirit what a change and when Paul eventually writes a letter to the church at Ephesus guess what he has nothing to correct he doesn't write any correction to the church at Ephesus this was a church that was thoroughly purged by the Lord so then next thing that happens is this is a riot this is verse 21 to 41 you see Paul purposed to leave Ephesus he wanted to move on but you know Paul was a person who was led of the Holy Spirit he often didn't know whether he was being led of the Holy Spirit he had to trust that the Lord was leading him he had to be very sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and he stayed not knowing why but he stayed on and he sent Timothy away and he sent Erastus away he said go into Macedonia find out what's going on and comfort the believers bless them teach them of course a little bit later after the riot Paul's able to leave himself but he didn't know why he was staying behind he just knew that he was obeying the Lord have you ever had that experience in your life when you're doing something and you don't know why you're doing it but it's in God's plan and you're not supposed to know why. You're supposed to just be sensitive to the Lord and to do as he leads you. And later when you look back you think, Ah, now I know why God led me to do that. You see? But you didn't know at the time, of course. And that's what happened with Paul. He sent away Timothy and Erastus and stayed in Asia for a season. So what happened? Well, something happened in Ephesus that was very dangerous. Ephesus was a, it was the capital of Asia Minor, capital of Turkey. It was massive. It was dedicated to Artemis, or as we call her, Diana, who was the huntress. Okay? The whole city was dedicated to Diana. And um, there was a man in the city called Demetrius. And he was a silversmith. And his job was to make little statues. They were about nine inches tall, made of pure silver, and they cost a lot of money. 
And people would save up. They were very poor, but they would save up and buy one of these. And then they would put it in a little shrine in their home. And every day, maybe ten times a day, they'd bow down to this little shrine of uh, Demetrius or Diana. And uh, what Paul's what Paul's evangelism was doing, it was wiping away all of the idolatry of Ephesus. All the idolatry of Ephesus was being undermined. Why? Because Paul would stand up there and he'd say, well, these, these, silver, these silver idols, they're not God at all. The real God is the God of heaven. He isn't in a little statue. He's the God of heaven. We saw when we were looking at Paul on Mars Hill that he completely demolishes all the idolatry of the Greeks in just a, in just a short talk of only 12 sentences. He just completely demolishes them. He says God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He isn't worshipped by your hands as if he needs anything. He is the one who gives life and breath and all things. And in him we live and have our being. Now then he said, if we live in him, you mustn't think that God is made of silver and gold and wood. No, 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 no. The real God, the God of heaven, is the one who lives in heaven. He doesn't live inside your little temple. So Paul completely demolished idolatry in, in Ephesus. And so what did Demetrius do? Well, let me give you a little tip here. In the preaching of the gospel, watch out. Do you know why? Because the preaching of the gospel will one day come face to face with the economy of the devil. Do you know what? Demetrius was a very wealthy man. He's what we would call a millionaire today. And he made a lot of money out of selling these idols. And so what he did, he was so furious that Paul was telling everybody not to buy the idols that what he did he said right come on we need to do something about this and they set up a riot a dangerous riot and they caught and uh, the whole city was filled with confusion it's very interesting in this passage that they went into the main amphitheatre and in the main amphitheatre they gathered all the people of the city and for two hours they shouted great is Diana of the Ephesians great is Diana of the Ephesians and they were so mad about it they shouted like that for two hours until they eventually ran out of voice and Paul wanted to go out and stand in the middle of them and tell them sorry but there's no God called Diana there's only one God and he's the God of heaven and the Christians said Paul if you do that they'll rip you to pieces don't do that don't do that. And uh, the whole city, they grabbed hold of Gaius and Aristarchus, who were men from Macedonia, and they beat them. They beat them. Um, and certain chief men of Asia that were friends sent to him and said, Do not go into the theatre, Paul. They'll kill you on the spot. Paul was a brave man. But... Um, and notice a little word. I want you to notice a little word in verse 32. Can you see in the Bible it says assembly? We got that? It says the whole assembly was confused. That's the word church. Did you know that the word church is not always referring to a Christian church? Because ecclesia is what the Greek expression is. It's two words. Ek means out of. And ecclesia means the people. And... Uh, this was a riot of people that had been gathered out from the city. So it was a separate group that had been called out of the city. And so that's something we need to know about. The word church isn't always a word referring to Christians. Anyway, the main point is this, that um, eventually the, uh, the craftsmen had their way. And they brought great persecution against the Christians. And uh, guy, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the ruler of the city, a Roman ruler of the city, he gathered the people together and he said, Now listen, you need to stop this. Everybody knows you worship Diana of the Ephesians. The whole world knows that you worship Diana of the Ephesians. Now he says... 
There would have been, uh, would have been about 24,000 spectators at this point. It's a big group. He says, look, you see the courts? You go to the courts and you prosecute Paul if you want to. Or you prosecute the Christians if you can. But he said, this riot, you will be called to account for this riot. The Romans didn't like people rioting. They usually dealt with riots very forcibly. People died when there were riots. You see, the Romans didn't have any messing about. They would just assemble the soldiers and they would go through the riot and just kill everybody that riots. They didn't arrest anybody. They didn't bother arresting anybody. They just put them to death. He says, you need to stop this riot. He said, but what you do need to do, if you really feel that, you have done, that they've done something wrong against you, then the courts are open. Go to court. Now this has happened many times in history. It happened in the Welsh Revival. Do you know in the time of the Welsh Revival you couldn't get a drink in Wales from Cardiff to Llandudno? Not on a Sunday. In fact for the first 20 years after the Revival you couldn't get a drink any day of the week. All the, all the pubs went out of business. Nobody could sell the stuff. Why is that? Because the Spirit of God swept through people's lives. Alcohol they saw as a great sin. They stopped doing it. They smashed the beer barrels in the street. Let it run down the drain. Why? Because nobody would buy the stuff. This is what God does in a community. And for something like about 12 years in Wales, um, uh, each year the <coughs> chief constable of a, of a town or a city would go to the magistrates and on a cushion he would present a white glove and that was a sign that there were no cases to be heard amazing isn't it imagine a whole society so transformed by the gospel that there's no crime I went, I was an evangelist I went over to Dorgetley one day was preaching in the street and a lady heard me and she stopped and talked and I said oh yes I said I notice nobody has any doors locked in this place the key is in the front door of every house oh she said we don't have crime here we don't have crime here what a testimony that was nearly 80 years after the revival there's still no crime do you know what she said to me and you can't say this about many places in England she said we had a murder once how many places can you say that about that's what God does you see in a community he doesn't just change people and turn them into Christians he cleans up the whole community and sometimes it happens very quickly at, at Ephesus it occurred all within a matter of a few days in Wales the revival swept through Wales in only three months 110,000 people converted in three months wow and of course we don't know what's happening today the books about today are not being written yet but God is working today and he's changing society and he's cleaning up society through the preaching of the gospel and when the gospel is preached faithfully the whole lives are transformed and so what we see at Ephesus what do we see at Ephesus what we see at Ephesus is revival did everybody get saved? I don't think everybody got saved. But everybody felt the fear of God. And the courts must have become idle. They must have become empty. Because husbands and wives got back together. Fathers became kind to their children. Whole industries were revived. God transformed the whole of society at Ephesus. And what was the thing that they used? Was it a coffee morning? I don't think so. It was the prayer meeting. That's what changed society. And it wasn't, it wasn't just a fair, a Christmas fair that changed society. It was the preaching of the gospel. It's the preaching of the gospel that changed society. And we need to remember that the apostolic tools were only ever two. Got that? There's two, two weapons the apostles always had. Prayer and the preaching of the word. That's all they had. They didn't have PAs 
and they didn't have a big crusade and they didn't have buses and they didn't have TV and they didn't have magazines and they didn't have all the stuff of today but they had prayer and they had preaching of the word and when dear Evan Roberts said to the Lord he said Lord I'd like to send a team all over Wales to preach the gospel the Lord said no you'll go by yourself and I'll bless you and he said well I don't need any money Lord do you know Lord I've got so much savings I can pay you for the privilege of doing it and what a great mission that was so there we are we're getting a wonderful insight aren't we you know the Acts of the Apostles is the handbook for church life it's all the various circumstances that we would meet all the different types of people that we would meet and when we read it this beautiful book from Luke it explains all of the things that we would ever meet in life but I tell you something it's hairy reading put your hand up if you've ever been in a riot for the gospel I can't John Wesley you know when he went to preach around England when he first started his ministry they would oppose him in the streets even the local clergyman would bring out a riot and they'd pay every man a shilling and they'd get them drunk before it so that they could attack the Methodist preachers in this country that's what happened that's why we're living in a Christian country today and on two or three occasions he, he never wore a wig he always had his ordinary hair they would pull him through the street by his hair he said and in all of it he said I never felt any fear he said when they attacked me with dead cats and dirt and stones he said <clears throat> he said I just felt the presence of Jesus even more even more he had the supernatural assistance of the Lord to face the mobs of England in his day and John Wesley outlived all his opponents he lived till he was 90 they were all dead when he was going around being honored as if he was Prime Minister what a man of God what a great change now in France they had a revolution in England we had John Wesley that's what we had well there we are that's the word of God today let's let's um 